constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. Little roller up along first. Behind the bag. It gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight, and the Mets win. Now the 2-1. Line drive in the corner. Just as the score of the tying run. Green to the plate. And he is safe. Safe at the plate. The Braves go to the World Series. Have reserved seats somewhere along one of the baselines set when they were children and cheered their heroes. Gibson swings and a fly ball to deep right field. This is going to be a home run. Unbelievable. A three-run home run for Bucky Dent. The Yankees now lead it by a score of three to two. Ladies and gentlemen, Mazeroski has hit a one-nothing pitch over the left field fence at Ford Field to win the 1960 World Series. They'll arrive at your door as innocent as children longing for the past. The Pope arrived at Yankee Stadium. As one enthusiastic announcer put it, he is standing on second base. Reggie Jackson. was good and it could be again broadcast it live Balls coming from all over the place. Left field, center field, right field. See, this this is the kind of thing, quite honestly, right now, that makes you want to see the Chicago Cubs team lose. Now, are you just saying you want to have fun, or do you really want to have fun? It'll be fun. Will the next person that sees anybody throw anything onto this field, point them out, or get them out of here. You don't live in Cleveland. Get in you talking to me? You talking to me? That is the farthest thing in the universe from the truth. Hello, everyone, live. It's the Dan Scott Show. And right there is your host, Dan Scott. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Monday edition of the program. After a very eventful weekend, 
I am your host, Dan Scott. Good to have you with us. It is a beautiful Monday morning as I sit here looking out the uh, window towards Paris Mountain overlooking Paladin Stadium here and uh, just a beautiful day, sunshine, blue skies, and I uh, hope that uh, your day's off to a great start. Your week is off to a great start. You know, our goal here, if it is, we'll try not to do anything to mess it up. If it's not, then maybe we can provide you with just a little bit of a lift. And the uh, end game object is always to learn something we did not know by the time the show is done. And that usually uh, starts right here in this chair. Uh, good show for you today at 1015. Don Clardy will be with us. We'll continue our week by week look at the 1988 championship season, the 30th anniversary of that season for Furman football. And uh, we're going to look at the last game of the regular season against the Citadel, which was for the Southern Conference Championship. So we'll be visiting with Don via phone coming up in uh, just uh, about 10 or 11 minutes. Uh, it was, a, a, as I said, an eventful weekend for Furman Athletics. Um, the, the basketball program having already captured national attention for a pair of, of uh, big events. The win over Loyola uh, two Fridays ago, one of the final four teams from a year ago, and then Jordan Lyons tying the NCAA record for 15 threes in a game, 15 made three-pointers in a game, uh, against North Greenville in the middle of the week, actually on Thursday, took its uh, show on the road again to defending national champion Villanova and stunned the Wildcats, ranked number nine in the country, with an overtime victory to improve to 5-0 and for the first time in 31 years. And uh, it has created quite the buzz, as you might imagine, not just here on campus and not just here in Greenville, but Furman is getting uh, an incredible amount of national publicity, the kind of publicity that, quite honestly, a school this size or a school many sizes simply cannot buy. And as I said earlier, what you're seeing here and what you've seen with football in the last couple of years and the resurrection of the program under Clay Hendricks it is a clear indication that you can be a high-level academic school, you can be a high-level athletic school, and the two can actually complement each other. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you this, that many people who had never heard of Furman University until the win over Villanova on Saturday night Googled and found out about this school and this campus and about the Greenville area, athletics truly can be the front door to the entire university. And, well, let's just, let's just leave it at that for a moment anyway. Uh, it was just a, a big, big event in the history of this school, and it benefited not just Bob Ritchie's basketball program, but it benefited the entire university. It benefited the Greenville community. And, oh, by the way, as I said, they're 5-0 and now, bringing it back home for the first time in uh, 31 years and uh, are back in action on Wednesday night at Timmins Arena. This will be a good test to, to see how much of a buzz it actually has created because you're playing at 6.30 on the night before Thanksgiving with the students gone. Uh, against a Division II team in Southern Wesleyan. So we'll, we'll see what kind of crowd is on hand for that one at Timmins. Uh, and then on the road to UNC Asheville on Sunday. And, and the grind is going to kind of start to begin now a little bit for Bob Ritchie's team. You're going to hear from the coach. You're going to hear from, uh, I see a little highlight uh, action coming up here in just a bit. Uh, there's a lot that we're going to get into uh, concerning the, uh, the, the Furman win, the impact that it has had, and, and what kind of impact we can expect it to have moving forward after taking down Villanova in overtime. The, uh, the not-so-good news this weekend, it was kind of a, a two-fold scenario, good news, bad news. The good news was Furman football won on Saturday 
at Mercer, 35-30, to close out the regular season at 6-4, and four, winning six of their final seven games, but unfortunately did not get an automatic bid or uh, an at-large bid into the FCS playoffs, so the season is over for Clay Hendricks' club. It's really kind of disappointing to see it come to an end the way that it did. Um, you know, Furman went into the game on Saturday, you recall, needing uh, three different circumstances to all fall their way in order to get the automatic bid and take the decision out of the hands of the committee. Two of the three happened, but unfortunately the third one did not. Uh, Samford did upset ETSU in Johnson City. The Paladins did win at Mercer, but they could not hold Mercer to 16 points or less. I will say this, though. Early in the season, probably through the first half of the season or so, when something went wrong with this team on the field, something catastrophic, something big happened in a negative way, this team did not handle adversity well at all. Clay Hendricks has talked about it a, a number of times having to handle adversity better, have to be better, be tougher when things aren't going your way. And, and I think back to the, the loss to ETSU, which as we kind of talked about as the season went on, you're going to likely look back at that one and play the what-if game. You're up 20 with four or five, maybe six minutes to go in the third quarter and you let that game get away from you. And, and as you go back and diagnose it, if you make a play here or one here or a stop there, we're talking about a completely different set of circumstances. We're talking about Furman being the automatic qualifier and the standalone champ rather than sharing the championship in a three-way tie. Um, but, I, I, again, I'll say this. As the season went on, this team got better at handling adversity, and I think there's no better example of that than on Saturday when given what was at stake and knowing that they had to hold Mercer to 16 points or less along with winning the game to get the automatic bid, to fumble on the opening play of the second half, have it picked up and returned for a touchdown, the extra point kick, made it 20 to 17 Furman's league cut to three. It was 20 to 10 at the half. All of a sudden the dreams, the possibilities of the automatic uh, bid go out the window. And had this been the first half of the season when something like that happened, th this team most likely would not have responded well, but I think it's a tremendous credit to these kids, to this coaching staff and the way they continue to, to work with these players and how they grew and matured as the season went on, that they survived that kind of a gut punch and were able to withstand it, turn around, come back, drive down the field and score, and ultimately win that game 35-30, to 30, making big plays when they needed to make big plays and, and punctuating it with the redshirt freshman Adrian Hope sacking Kalon Davis on the final play of the game to register his FCS leading 15th sack of the season. This is a redshirt freshman who's a part-time player. Beware of number 81 in ensuing seasons. So to, to have it end that way, um, the, to, to miss the playoffs was disappointing. There's no question about that. But uh, the way this team bounced back, to gain a share of the championship, the 14th conference championship in the history of the school, which is by far the most in all of, of uh, the Southern Conference. It, it was a, a great way to finish the season after starting 0-3 and, and having serious uh, problems at quarterback because of the injury to Harris Roberts early on. Um, now, the question is... How much better can they get in the offseason? They're going to be returning an awful lot of players, especially on offense. You are going to be replacing your quarterback. You are going to be replacing uh, your B-back. And uh, was there one other on the offensive side of the ball? I think maybe that was it. Um, 
may, maybe a maybe one of the uh, the three or four tailbacks that they use this season. But the offensive line is coming back, with the possible exception of Andy Godwin, who has another year but is uh, has graduated or will graduate and, and is so banged up physically that that's a question. But everybody else is coming back on the offensive side of the ball. You do have some defensive losses, especially along the defensive line with Chinedo Oconia. Uh, Jalen Reed, uh, Chris Washington, all uh, graduating. Akil Noor at safety, all graduating. Everybody else back. This is going to be a team with a lot of talent coming back. And, and as always, what are they doing the offseason to improve? We're going to talk more about football, including some of the um, some of the suspect numbers in the FCS selection. Uh, who got in that shouldn't have, and, and what criteria were they looking at? We'll, we'll take a glance at that coming up in just a little bit. Before we get into any of that, though, we're going to take a break. We'll come back, and joining us will be Don Clardy. We'll take a look back at 1988 and uh, the regular season finale against the Citadel. Uh, the show, as always, is brought to you by Carolina Creative, not just Simple, but simply brilliant. They have done my new website, thedanscottshow.com, which we want you to go out and, and check and spend some time at. Uh, they can do so much for your business. Just uh, get in touch with Randy. You're going to hear more about him. You see him uh, on our screen every time the show is live, uh, all the contact information, and uh, more about them as we head to this break. Don Clardy joins us on the other side. Dan Scott Show on a Monday. Just getting things cranked up. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody, Dan Scott here, and I want to tell you about my technology partner, Carolina Creative Group. When my show needed a creative technology boost, I turned to Carolina Creative Group. My custom design website is going to take marketing as well as brand strategy and development to new levels. The search engine optimization means that my clients' ads will be seen by more people more often, and if I have any questions, Carolina Creative Group is just a phone call away. Friends, that is just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. You can find out all the ways that Carolina Creative Group can help your business by simply calling 864-250-2012. Again, that's 864-250-2012. Or simply visit them online at carolinacreative.co. Carolina Creative Group technology partner of the Dan Scott Show. If you're looking for the perfect frame for that special photo or painting, Custom Corners Frame Shop in Seneca can deliver for you. Family owned for nearly four decades, Trevor and the folks at Custom Corners Frame Shop pride themselves on quality, presentation, and professionalism. They offer picture framing for every budget and every job is custom. Custom Corners Frame Shop also sells work from local artists as well as locally themed gifts. For more information, visit them at 289 Market Street in Seneca. Call 864-882-7736. Or find them on Facebook, Custom Corners Frame Shop in Seneca. Imagine a university. A university where your passion for protecting local water sources is encouraged. And now, your work not only benefits your career, but the health of those in your community and around the world. This is Furman. This is the Furman Advantage. Dan Scott here for the Atlanta Bread Company. What do I like about Atlanta Bread? Well, too much to mention in a short commercial, but here are a few things. Bread baked daily fresh on site, a tremendous selection of soup, sandwiches, and salads, seasonal special additions to the menu, delicious hot coffee, and a bevy of other drink options, and yeah, can't forget about the baked sweet goodies. Dine in or carry out, and when you have the Atlanta Bread Company app, you can order and pay online, then breeze past the lines to the pickup counter to get your food. Experience it for yourself. That's the Atlanta Bread Company, Cherry Dale Point in Greenville. 
When you go in search of a fence company, what's your criteria? Experience? Trust? A company that gets it right the first time and stands behind its work? Then your search is over. Faulkner Fence has been Greenville's fence company for more than 40 years. Ed Faulkner started the business, and now Sun Todd continues the tradition of excellence. So regardless of your fencing needs, commercial, industrial, or residential, trust the company that Greenville has trusted for over four decades. Faulkner Fence, 864-271-4626, or online at Faulkner Fence Company. Let me tell you something, Cowboy. This rookie can really bring the heat. He's smoky and spicy with a Chipotle style all his own. It's a new Montgomery Inn Chipotle barbecue sauce. Make it a part of your home team. Available now at your neighborhood grocer or online at cincyfavorites.com. All right, welcome back to the program. I am Dan Scott. Good to have you with us. Coming up uh, after this current segment, we're going to be uh, going back to basketball for a bit and spend some time uh, hearing from Coach Richie. Going to see a little highlight package from the win over Villanova and uh, take a look ahead at what's coming up. And then uh, toward the end of the program, some more thoughts on uh, Furman football as well. But we're going to the uh, celebrity guest line right now and bringing in Don Clardy. He, of course, was a sophomore wide receiver on the 1988 National Championship team as we continue the campus-wide celebration of the 30th anniversary of that title team. Also, now as a financial advisor for Northwestern Mutual, and he joins us every Monday. We're taking that 1988 season week by week and doing it in review. Don, how are you, my friend? Doing great today, Dan. I've now finally shed my large, cumbersome knee brace, gone to a smaller brace, definitely more mobile, so uh, getting around much better. Ready to, ready to start your rehab and, uh, and, and get out on the field and start running some pass patterns again, right? That's right. Ready, <laughs> ready and excited, no doubt about it. Hey, uh, for you as a guy who obviously – uh, won some conference championships as a player and, and that national title team. What does it mean for you, uh, for this team, playoff berth aside, or lack of a playoff berth aside, I guess, to be able to to say that, that it put up Furman's 14th conference championship? Uh, you know, there's a lot of pride in that. We've had a lot of success over the years at Furman, and in more recent years, those conference championships have gotten a little tougher to come by, so – I think there's a ton of pride in that, especially starting off the season a little slow, finishing as strong as they finished. Uh, I know our freshman year, we had a similar season where we started off kind of slow, finished really strong. I think we ended up at seven and four. We did not have a share of the conference title, uh, but we were still kind of on the on the edge as to whether we'd make the playoffs. So I know the guys, especially after what they did last year, are disappointed uh, not getting the, the respect and being named one of those 24 teams in the playoffs. But you can still look at the season and how they finished and having that share of the conference championship and, and take a, a lot away from that, have a, have a lot of pride around how strong they finished the season. So, so having, having kind of lived through that yourself, then how motivated do you expect these returning players to be in the off season to uh, to put in the kind of work necessary to be a championship caliber team again next year. Yeah, I think it just gives them a ton of momentum to flow right into the you know the off season training, and then spring practice will be here before you know it. I think Coach Hendricks likes to do spring practice a little earlier in the mm-hmm. spring, so just uh, you can't have much more motivation. And you know, if you think about again, if I look back to my playing days, we came off a similar year. Uh, had a ton of motivation to to go out and win the conference, make sure we made the playoffs the next year. And as you well know, Dan, this is a really young team this year. So a lot of, uh, on both offense and defense, a lot of great players coming back. So I think it positions them nicely. Uh, but, you know, the players have to pull together and just really work hard and, and get ready for next year to have a, I think a good opportunity to have another really good season. Yeah. And, and, uh, for accuracy's sake, uh, it must be said Clay Hendricks likes to do spring practice in the winter. 
uh, last yeah, year. Yeah. <laughs> last year they did it in February, and I would imagine that would probably be the case again. But you know what? I I think uh, bef- you know before we get to to 1988, I think the method to his madness was solid. He wanted to get spring practice in the books and give this team more time in the weight room, more time to work on strength and conditioning before fall practice. And I think as we look at the season and how it played out, it paid off. Yeah, I think so. And and you cannot underestimate the fact that, unfortunately, football is a, a physical, tough game, and you usually end up having a few injuries in spring practice as well. Uh, you try to limit that, but the earlier you can have spring practice, so if you do have a few guys that get banged up, it gives them more time to, to rehab and also just get healthy uh, for the season, which I think is very important because you just can't go through spring practice or the regular season, unfortunately, without getting some kind of injuries. So. Well, let's turn our attention to the final week of the regular season in 1988. And this was back in the era when Furman and the Citadel still played the last game of the regular season. The, the, the big rivalry game was played in the final weekend. And it so happened that this one had conference title implications on the line. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, that when I came into Furman, I was quickly quickly uh, <laughs> taught the value of of that uh, rivalry. So that was a huge game, and having it at the end of the season, and then you tack the conference championship element on top of that. I know uh, on the Satterfield show they said it was one of the I think possibly the third largest crowd, one of the largest crowds definitely we'd ever had at Paladin Stadium. So it was one of those times where you looked up on both sides of the field and the, the bleachers were full. So we knew it was a big time game for us. So how did this one, uh, how this one start off? Well, we started off with a little bit of adversity where we got a turnover uh, deep on our end. So before we blinked our eyes, they were up seven zero. but as we had done all season, the defense locked down. The offense came back, and uh, we went up 14-7. So we took it down the field, uh, went up 14-7 pretty quickly uh, in the first half. So we kind of reestablished uh, control of the game. Uh, but Citadel was really strong. I think they probably put up more rushing yards against our defense than any other team had the entire season. I think they ended up rushing for over 200 yards, certainly. Um, so our defense had their hands full, but just continued to make big plays. And, and then again, the offense, as the season went on, we just uh, became much more diverse. So again, we were uh, running the ball on them a lot, but a really solid passing game on that day as well. And You know, just a lot of people, it's been the theme of the year. It's almost like a broken record, just people stepping up. Our third-string fullback, Ron Sherwood, who had gotten to play little all year, had a big touchdown run. Donald Lipscomb, who was just a true freshman, broke out in the Citadel game, had a couple of big catches. He'd go on to be one of the leading receivers in Furman history, but at that point, he had caught very few passes up to that point. So you just continue to see guys stepping in, and making plays both offensively and defensively. I, I failed to ask, was this game at Paladin Stadium or was it down in Charleston? Yeah, no, it was at Paladin okay. Stadium. So it was nice to to have that game at home and, and, again, have that kind of crowd support coming out. As you know, the last game of the season is always kind of right around just before Thanksgiving. So it's nice to, to have that kind of outpouring. But a lot of those – folks on the other side of the stadium were, were coming to cheer on the Citadel too. So it was, it was, there were some loud roars uh, when the Citadel would make a play as well. So uh, you're up 14, seven after uh, surviving the, the early turnover. How did it go from there? Uh, we, we stretched the lead out a little bit, but then late in the third quarter, they came back and scored a touchdown. So at one point late in the third quarter, it was 24, 17. So we knew we were still in the game. Uh, we went down and had a long drive in the fourth quarter, uh, scored that final touchdown that I mentioned. Ron Sherwood actually scored that final touchdown. We went up 30 to 17. I think, I think we missed the extra point, uh, but we kind of held it at that for the rest of the game. So, um, you know, the clock showed zero and we, you know, 
at least our class, that was our first conference championship. The seniors and juniors had seen that a couple of years before. So uh, everybody was just really excited. And, of course, based on what had happened the prior year, everybody was just thrilled to to have that conference championship and know that we were going to likely have a home playoff game the next week. Yeah, it was the first one since 1985. Uh, right. So there had been a three-year gap that was closed out with the uh, – the uh, championship uh, with the win over the Citadel. So what did Coach Satterfield have to say afterwards? You know, he was just – I just think he was tickled to death. He, he's not uh, one to get overly excited, but I think, you know, he – since his tenure as head coaches started, that was our first conference championship, and he was following up a legend – and Dick Sheridan. So uh, I know he was just thrilled. And, and we all knew the hard work we put into that. We really, all the coaches, the players, everyone involved with the program had just put in a ton of work. So I think it was just such a, a satisfying feeling to to reach that goal at that time, especially with a lot of people not giving us the respect at the beginning of the season, picking us to finish in the middle of the conference. So you just – pull all of that together and culminating in a conference championship. I think everybody was just, just really excited. It was interesting watching the interviews, you know, of players and coaches right after the game and just, everybody was just, just really happy. Yeah. As you might imagine, Don Clardy joining us as we continue looking back at the 88 season, the championship year next year, it'll or next week rather, it'll be round one of the uh, uh, what was then called the Division One Double A playoffs, and uh, we'll start to follow the postseason track with Don beginning next week. Uh, right now, Don, tell everybody uh, what you do at Northwestern Mutual and how you can help them. Yeah, so uh, we do uh, really comprehensive financial planning, investment management, risk management mention a lot of the different things that we do. One thing that we do uh, that a lot of people are interested in is we can do fee-based financial planning. So someone may have a person that helps them with their investments or their risk management and insurance, but they really don't have anyone that helps them have an overall comprehensive financial plan. So we can bring them in, sit down with them, find out their vision and goals for the future, uh, help them determine what they need to do to be financially secure. So that's a that's a process we go through and really help people have a good plan to go out and execute for the future. Um, so that's one of the things that, that we can help people with, even if they may have another advisor that already helps them, you know, individually with investments or, or insurance or what have you. So um, that's something that, that we, we, were, we are really – planning focus so that's something that we do really well all right and that email address for people who may want to get in touch with you don.clarty at n as in northwestern m as in mutual dot com sounds good hey listen good stuff we'll uh, start the playoff track next week looking forward to it dan thanks for having me all right don thank you that is don clarty a member of the 88 national championship team as we continue going week by week through that season when we come back we flip back to basketball you'll see some of the highlights of Furman's win at number nine Villanova the defending national champs and Bob Ritchie's television interview afterwards and still to come after that a few more thoughts on football not making the playoffs and uh, also a little tribute to the boys in the booth Dan Scott show returns in just a moment For a child battling a critical illness, a wish come true can be a turning point. One song, one dance, one game, one moment changes everything. Make-A-Wish needs your support to grant more life-changing wishes. Visit Make-A-Wish online now. Together, we can transform lives one wish at a time. Hall's Chop House in downtown Greenville is the Greenville Steakhouse. Why? Well, it starts with the Allen Brothers Prime Steaks out of Chicago. The rest of the menu falls into place there. But it really goes beyond that. It's their level of service, their commitment to that service. The place is packed every night, and yet Billy and his staff have a way of making you and your table feel like you're the most important table in the place. They have lunch on Fridays and Saturdays, brunch on Sundays, live music every time the doors are open, The Greenville Steakhouse is Hall's Chop House, Main Street, downtown. Tell them you heard about them on the Dan Scott Show. Mayhem is everywhere. I'm a fight in the stadium parking lot. 
one of us was rooting for the home team, the other was also rooting for the home team, but misheard the first one. Them's fighting words. Now we're working this out all over your car. And this could last a while, because we're evenly matched. We're both big, we're both better at punching stuff than doing puzzles. We both think Italy's in South America. We both peaked somewhere between 8th grade uh, and the second time we took 8th grade. Oh, and while you were gone, we've both been rammed repeatedly by the other into your car. Our already scarred faces will heal, but if you've got cut rate insurance, you could be living with these dents. So get all state, where agents help keep you protected from mayhem. <laughs> like me. Are you in good hands? And easily, it's Ray Williams, Allstate, 864-859-7504. Looking for a great car, but your credit needs work? Premier Auto Motivations is a professional referral service motivated to help you drive a car you love while rebuilding your credit. Late model cars of all kinds. Premier Auto Motivations can get you on the road and your credit on the road to recovery today. Serving all of upstate South Carolina, it's Premier Auto Motivations. Call Sherry today at 864-722-3785 or email cricketgravely at gmail.com. Go the Distance Performance Coaching offers individualized coaching for distance runners of all ability levels, beginner to seasoned runner, and exists to help you achieve your running goals. All training plans are custom built, tailor-made just for you based on your experience, current fitness level, entry history, and goals. You're going to receive expert coaching from Hall of Fame runner Brock Bailey, and Coach Brock is ready to help you go the distance. You can find out everything you need to know about Go the Distance Performance Coaching and Brock Bailey at the website gocoach.run. Gocoach.run. That's Go the Distance Performance Coaching. Hi, welcome back to the show. I am Dan Scott, and uh, our thanks to Don Clardy for joining us in the previous segment. Uh, next week, we'll begin the uh, playoff trek in 1988 and continue looking back week by week at that championship season, the 30th anniversary celebration. Hashtag diamonds are forever here on Furman's campus. Uh, before we uh, get uh, any further along, just a reminder about our partnership here with Make-A-Wish South Carolina and continue to remind you about the urgent need for financial help for these folks. They do such a phenomenal job in making the wishes of critically ill children come true. They grant about one wish on average every 48 hours. But when their fiscal year ended at the end of August, they had a waiting list of almost 200 wishes. And the only thing that kept them from doing it was the fact that they needed more financial help. So you see the uh, website at the bottom of your screen, sc.wish.org. Go right to the donate page, and you can make a financial contribution. You can donate air miles. You can give them a car that they can sell and reap the benefits from it. There's so many ways you can help. Uh, an average wish costs about $7,500, some more, some less. That's why it's called the average. Uh, but the bottom line is the work that they do to make differences in these children's lives is just incredible. And I am so proud to be um, partnered with Make-A-Wish South Carolina and looking forward to ways that we can continue to uh, help them grow and, and get get more and more of these wishes granted. Because as I've told you before, it has, data shows that it has a, a value in, in helping these children many times recover from whatever that critical illness is. So uh, do what you can. sc.wish.org is the website for Make-A-Wish South Carolina. Well, the uh, entire nation really is, is buzzing. You're, you're starting to see in some of the new college basketball polls come out uh, at the beginning of the week, Furman even being mentioned now after not only beating Loyola Chicago last Friday, but coming back uh, eight days later this past Saturday and knocking off ninth-ranked and defending national champion Villanova both on the road. It has 
captured the attention of many. Bob Ritchie has now been termed a rising star in the coaching profession, and uh, it has been quite the uh, quite the last week or ten days. It was really cool to see. There were uh, probably a couple of hundred people, maybe more than that, who came out to meet the bus when it got back from the airport yesterday as the team arrived back from Philadelphia. Uh, you may have seen it on the news uh, on Furman's social media. It was a uh, fantastic scene and very much well-deserved. If you did not see any of the uh, highlights, there's a little melt that our people put together, a little music to take you through it as well. Here's some of Furman and Villanova give you a little feel of what that upset was like on Saturday. Who's trying to do something that hasn't been done in over 30 years at Furman, and that's go 5-0, and oh, and they're hot right now. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, you, you may have seen online the uh, locker room celebration. Bob Ritchie, who you'll see the TV interview here in just a moment. Uh, the rest of the team was in the locker room waiting for him, and he came half sprinting, half high stepping in. Uh, the dancing and the celebration began. He got doused with the Gatorade bucket. It, it was a, a really neat scene to watch unfold. Uh, but that was not before uh, he got brought to the uh, national broadcasting table. Uh, the FS2 broadcast team wanted a word with the uh, man of the hour coaching the team of the hour. Here's Bob right after the game on the FS2 broadcast. A tremendous effort by your squad tonight. How about that? That was fun. <laughs> you said you fun. wanted to have fun. Yeah. You had fun, right? That, that was the whole deal. You know, I started staying this Monday. You know, we had a game Tuesday night, Thursday night, and coming here Saturday. And I told, I told my wife of all people, I said, if we take care of business Tuesday, and then we went on Thursday, Friday, we're going to go enjoy ourselves in Philadelphia. We're going to keep this thing loose. We're going to walk through that night, walk through in the morning. And, uh, you know, we didn't practice yesterday. We literally did not practice, and we walked through at the hotel, and and it was about it was about trusting our guys, and it was about getting them fresh, and knowing that we could we were we belonged in this environment, and uh, man, did they, you know, <laughs> did they? I mean, we had chances where it looked like it was getting a little crazy, and they just responded. But I tell you, we're learning a lot about our team, and uh, you know, it's it's a great group to be around because they just keep fighting and they keep swinging, and uh, what a great day to be a paladin. You know, our football team won, so I think they secured a share of the, of the conference championship. We got this win here versus national power, and, uh, man, what, what a day to be a paladin. Well, you know your guys aren't going to want to practice now. They're going to say, remember that time? <laughs> we, just, we just watched them <laughs> and walked it. through. That's right? it. But at what point in this game, Coach, did you have a feeling, and maybe it wasn't until the zeros, but did you feel like, we got a shot. We have a chance to win this game. You know, the, the crowd was electric, and uh, when I saw on the timeline that it was going to take six minutes to, to get the starters and all that done, I knew there was going to be a lot of energy and I felt like we had to be able to endure that energy mm -hmm. and I felt like that we had to be able to be be in the game in those first 10 minutes and we didn't have to necessarily be up or tied we just had to be in the game and uh, once we were in that 10 minute mark in the first half and I saw that what we were doing offensively that we were getting pretty good shots and then a couple of defensive adjustments that we made w was bothering them a little bit and uh, I, you know you just you go into halftime and you, you feel good about things you just got to keep you got to keep fighting you know defense travels and an offense that knows what it's doing, what you know, what various pieces are supposed to be doing, that plays well together, that travels too. It seems like those are two things that you really leaned on in this game. You know, it's in, in team sports, I think we forget what team really means. And what I love about our group is we are a team, and our staff's a team. All our families are here on this trip. 
we're, we're just a team, and, and, and we say connected all the time. That's what we want to do. We want to be connected on defense, but we also try to be connected on offense. And, you know, the, the go-to guy is the open guy, and we, we want to move that ball, and we want to move bodies. And I was just proud of how they played. I was proud of Jordan Lyons coming off of all his accolades the last 48 hours. I thought he let the game come to him, and I thought they really tried to take him out, and I thought they tried to deny him a lot early. But he really didn't get frustrated. And, uh, you know, Clay Mounts with a big three in overtime, you know, he just keeps making blink. I mean, I could go on and on. Yeah, well, I'm just proud of my group. Listen, they did a great job, but you did a great job as well as a coach for, for putting them and setting them up and putting them in a position to win, and they did that for you. They did. And, and you know, we got to overtime, and, and it was so calm. You know, it was so <laughs> calm. I mean, Matt missed the free throw, yep. right? And how, how many times in life will you just fold up right there? Yeah, right. And then who makes the big shot to put us up six late? Yeah, same, guy. same guy. Just th those moments. That, that's what makes all this special. That's great. And, um, so we're just, you know, wow, it's really happy. Play another one in two days. <laughs> Thanks so much, Coach. Enjoy a, a very, very special Congratulations. Play. All right. And Appreciate I'm sure it's going to be something that he Great really win. is going to get an opportunity wow. to enjoy, not only with his players, but with the fan base as well. Huge victory for Furman on the road against Villanova as Furman gets the victory in overtime here against the defending national champs. Fun stuff. It really was. It was good to see. And as I, uh, I tweeted uh, afterwards, uh, Brian Lambert, he keeps one up on me on these broadcast things. You know, he he uh, was on the road because I was doing football. And, and when you're the play by play guy uh, for a school like this, uh, you, you, you stick with the season that is um, that you've been with before you make a move on. So I, I, I'm staying you know, with football at this juncture until football season is over. So Bryant goes to Loyola. They get the uh, last second win on the dunk there. We come back. Uh, I get the uh, incredible honor of, of being the you know, TV play-by-play -play guy for Jordan Lyons record-setting night. And then they go on the road again, and all Bryant gets to do is, is be on the call for the win over Villanova. Uh, that was that was great stuff. It really was. Now uh, again, uh, the uh, the test is going to be uh, coming back here uh, Wednesday and playing a Division two team the night before Thanksgiving. Uh, we'll see what kind of crowd that there is here. The students are going to be gone. Uh, we'll see who's here. I uh, would hope that some folks would make it out. Then on the road uh, to UNC Asheville. Yeah, so you know, you, you you tell yourself, man, it's it's in, in one sense, and this is true, it's easy to get up as a, a school like Furman, players like uh, on this Furman team. It's easy to get up to go and play at a Loyola. It's easy to get up to go and play at a Villanova. You know, how then are you going to respond against a D two Southern Wesleyan going on the road to UNC Asheville, and and then you know getting further into the non-conference season with, oh, by the way, a conference game on December the 1st against Western Carolina. So tests remain for this team, obviously, but 5-0 and getting all kinds of national publicity. As I said, the, the national publicity that this school has gotten in, in the last uh, week and a half is just something you can't buy. You simply cannot buy the kind of attention that the school has gotten. And I just hope that people here understand again, that athletics and academics, one does not have to take precedence over the other. One does not have to, to happen at the expense of the other. And this is a perfect example of how they complement one another. And, and uh, Furman, at, at least in this instance, is getting it right, and it's pretty cool to see. All right, one more break. We'll come back, and we'll close it out with some thoughts on football. Let you hear from Clay Hendricks uh, on the field in, amidst the celebration after the, the win over Mercer, and, and then uh, a look at who's in the playoff field and why, and then some thoughts moving forward to next season. We'll do that. In the final segment, when we wrap it up on the other side, this is a Dan Scott Show, and we'll return in just a moment. <laughs> 
When you're looking for the home of a lifetime, you need a realtor you can trust. With more than 27 years' experience selling real estate, Gel Sartain is the choice to help the discriminating buyer find the home of their dreams. Licensed in both South Carolina and Georgia, Gel specializes in homes on beautiful lakes Hartwell and Kiwi, as well as the surrounding areas, and has a wealth of experience working with people with technical backgrounds. Now is the time to buy, sell, and invest in real estate in the Clemson Seneca area. Let Gail help you realize that dream today. Call her at 404 317 3171. That's Gail Sartain, a member of the National Association of Realtors. We're all trying to find our way, forge a path, blaze a trail. The work is hard and the work is personal, but you can't do it alone. At Furman, we're committed to giving you an advantage, the Furman Advantage. We know that graduates who are emotionally supported and who have deep learning experiences in college are three times as likely to be engaged at work and thriving in life. At Furman, all students are guaranteed four years of rigorous classroom education integrated with high impact research, internships, study away, and a community of support every step of the way. This is the Furman Advantage. Hey everybody, Dan Scott. You know, I've been telling you for some time now that I switched to protection of my home and family to Security Complete. I can tell you that I've been ecstatic with the results. Locally owned with more than 40 years experience in the industry, Security Complete uses nothing but the latest technology, which equals low overhead, which equals greater savings to the customer. Fully automated systems with monitoring rates much lower than the competition. Security Complete gives you all this and does not require a contract of any length. Find out more by calling 864-546-0630 or find them on Facebook and Twitter. Security Complete, my first line of defense. Make them yours today. Let me tell you something, Cowboy. This rookie can really bring the heat. He's smoky and spicy with a Chipotle style all his own. It's a new Montgomery Inn Chipotle barbecue sauce. Make it a part of your home team. Available now at your neighborhood grocer or online at cincyfavorites.com. Hey, everybody. Dan Scott here, and I want to tell you about my technology partner, Carolina Creative Group. When my show needed a creative technology boost, I turned to Carolina Creative Group. My custom design website is going to take marketing as well as brand strategy and development to new levels. The search engine optimization means that my clients' ads will be seen by more people more often. And if I have any questions, Carolina Creative Group is just a phone call away. Friends, that is just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. You can find out all the ways that Carolina Creative Group can help your business by simply calling 864 850-2012. Again, that's 864-250-2012. Or simply visit them online at carolinacreative.co. Carolina Creative Group, technology partner of the Dan Scott Show. All right, we've got uh, one more segment here on this Monday. Uh, incidentally, we'll be recording this week's edition of Furman Sports Weekly uh, shortly after we're done here. And uh, guess who the guest is going to be? Yeah, Bob Ritchie will be here. So that is uh, coming up, Furman Sports Weekly. It'll be released on Furman's Facebook page coming up right around 5 o'clock this afternoon. So the uh, football team does not make the playoffs, but it does uh, win a share of the conference championship, the 14th in this uh, proud football program's history. And for the first time since 2008-2009, the team finishes with back-to-back winning records. Uh, that's what Clay Hendricks has done in his first two seasons here. Uh, after the 35-30 win uh, against Mercer down in Macon, Georgia on Saturday, Clay was uh, caught up with by Hunter Reed, the SID, on the field in the midst of all the celebration that was going on, and here's what he had to say. 30 Southern Conference title clinching win over the Mercer Bears here in Macon. The coach, a year ago, you got to start 0-3. You finish strong, come up a little short for a title, but this year you push that ball across the line, you get a share of the 
14th Southern Conference Championship in program history. You got to be pleased with your team's effort to come on the road and, and clinch it here in Macon. Uh, thrilled with our effort. You know, uh, <laughs> it it certainly wasn't easy, and I knew it wouldn't be. Uh, just just proud of our proud of our kids and the resiliency they showed, and you know, it took a true team effort. I mean, our whole organization, from our training staff to equipment. And, you name it, and uh, i just just really proud for our kids. You know, you come out and start the second half, you unfortunately had a turnover, but you, you seemed to answer, and then you produced a 95-yard touchdown drive, really were able to stabilize things, and your defense came up big there in the fourth quarter, and your offense did enough to get first downs burn out the clock. Yeah, you know what, we, sh we faced our share of adversity this year, and obviously I think we've learned something from that. And, you know, one thing I said about these kids, they hang in there and fight, and they did that tonight. Uh, and, and you know, we had to have that on both sides of the ball and uh, you know, just couldn't be prior for our group. I was, I was sitting out there Thursday at practice in the stadium and I looked on that field house wall up there and you know you can't imagine putting a 2018 up there and, and certainly we'll be able to do that and uh, I couldn't be happier for our, our fans. We had a great group of people here tonight and made a lot of noise and uh, just happy for everybody associated with our program. Congratulations, Coach. Thank you, Hunter. Clay Hendricks following. So there's just a few thoughts from uh, Clay Hendricks. He, he was uh, uh, with us a, a little more extended on the radio post game with uh, Tom and, and Marcus down on the field uh, and, and amongst all of that that was going on. And he just continued to talk about how proud he was of the team and the effort of the team. And that's the one thing I think that stands out above and beyond anything else with this group this season was just they continue to put the effort in, the effort in the weight room, the effort on the practice field, the effort in the film room, the effort on the field. And to watch this team from where it was at year's beginning, uh, completely unknown at quarterback to where it finished up, um, you just have to tip a cap. And, and for Harris Roberts, making the most of his one opportunity to play, limited as it was because of injuries. But the fifth-year senior, it was clear that this offense ran best when Harris Roberts was running it. And for him to finish the way he did five touchdown passes to finish with 11 on the season, he had six coming in through five in that game. And uh, it was a, a big, big way for his career to wrap up. Uh, unfortunately, as it turned out. And just to kind of, you know, you, you can get caught up in the in the bitter pill portion of, of getting left out of the playoffs when, when uh, you start looking around. Uh, there are some numbers that I do want to share with you. Um, Furman joins Chattanooga as the only Southern Conference champion or, or a share of a championship uh, back in 2013, not to make the FCS playoffs. Um, Scott Keeler pointed out on his Twitter timeline that, oddly enough, both teams beat up on the actual uh, auto bid that year. Uh, Furman beat Wofford 34-14 this season. And back in 2013, Chattanooga thumped Furman, who got the auto bid, 31-9 to in that score. And then, you know, the, the, the two things that does have people, uh, I think, universally scratching their heads is, number one, the Colonial Athletic Association gets six teams in the field. That is 25% of the entire field. And they don't play a true round-robin conference schedule. Everybody doesn't play everybody. Like Clay Hendricks said, if, if it'd be like Furman not having to play Wofford and Samford every year. Uh, so that that's one thing you kind of scratch your head at. And the other, when you take a look at the Sagarin ratings, which takes into account strength of schedule and, and, and that whole minutia that uh, the computer spits out, that has become one of the tools, supposedly, that committees use for basketball and, and everything else. The two teams out of the Southland Conference that got in um, – Lamar and Incarnate Word had worse Sagarin ratings. Incarnate Word had worse Sagarin ratings than five SOCON teams, Wofford, Furman, Citadel, uh, UTC, and Samford. And then uh, add two more to that list, uh, Mercer and ETSU, 
were ahead of Lamar. So, I mean, you can look at it. You can you can wonder what the committee was doing, and I think raise some very legitimate questions. The other side of the coin is, as I said earlier, as the season played out, you don't know this in the moment, but as it played out and we kind of started looking really uh, with within just a couple of weeks and, and thinking, man, this thing has a chance to come back and haunt us, and sure enough, it did. As the season played out, you don't blow a 20-point lead late in the third quarter to ETSU. We're not having any of these conversations. Furman is the outright champion and is going to be in on an auto bid. So uh, they, there are multiple ways to look at things. Bottom line is that when you leave your fate in the hands of people who go behind closed doors and call themselves a committee, you take the risk of something like this happening. So what do you do? You come back, you work harder next year, and, and you make sure that uh, you're not left up to this kind of chance again. You take matters into your own hands. So um, the football season ends at 6-4, and four, a share of the conference championship, Furman's 14th SOCON title, and, and again, far and away more than, than any other school in the conference and back-to-back -back winning seasons for the first time since 08 and 09. That's the thing that, that kind of threw me off guard a little bit, although it really shouldn't have now that I think about it because I just wrapped up my eighth football season and, and this is the first time in my eight years that there's been back-to-back -back seasons. And, and now with, with those, uh, there have been four winning seasons in the eight that I have been here. Um, but you know, this, this program, which, you, you know, you look on the, the building right out here off to my left and, and you see tacked onto that building, the, um, Southern conference champion numbers, which there will be a 2018 going up soon, but you see the stretch from 1978 through the mid eighties, you see 88, 89, and 90, and then 99, 2001, 2004. Just to, the fact that there were no years of back-to-back -back winning seasons since 08 and 09 uh, kind of tells you the, the uh, doldrums in which this program had kind of slipped into and, and the fact that Clay Hendricks has been able to turn the fortunes around. He and his phenomenal staff do what he's done in two years leads you to uh, uh, the only thing you can feel, this disappointment about not making the playoffs aside, the only thing you can legitimately feel is incredible excitement about where this football program is headed. Couple that with what's going on with basketball. The men's soccer team made it to the second round of the NCAA championships. Haven't even mentioned that. Lost to Virginia yesterday 2-0. You've got cross country uh, doing what they did in the NCAA meet over the weekend. Uh, so many other things. Women's basketball is off to a good start. You know me. I can't wait until baseball season gets here. I think this is going to be a special year for Brad Harker's club. There's a lot to be excited about here on this campus, and what we need is for you to come out here and see some of these things up close and personal. And that begins Wednesday night when the uh, Powell and men return to Timmins Arena to take on uh, Division II Southern Wesleyan College. Uh, what Southern Wesleyan University uh, at 6.30 p.m. And, um, hey, it's the night before Thanksgiving. You got some family maybe coming into town. Come out and treat them to a basketball game and help us, uh, help us build an atmosphere here on a day that traditionally would not be a great atmosphere day. And as I said, it's the first time to see this team since they came back after beating the number nine team in the country, the Villanova Wildcats, defending national champs. Let's see what we can do about getting some people in Timmins on Wednesday. All right, listen, you guys have a great rest of your day. I'm going to be recording Furman Sports Weekly with Bob Ritchie coming up here in about a half an hour. It'll be available on Furman's Facebook page within, uh, well, about 5 o'clock this afternoon, I believe. Go out and make an intentional effort to make a positive difference in somebody else's life. And until tomorrow, I'm Dan Scott saying God bless you and so long, everybody. <laughs>